I say I went to Nairobi and then got a plane mm -hmm. to come here from Eastern Station, <laughs> travel to Preston. And a friend of mine was living next to this Preston Station. You so know. you had somewhere to sleep yeah, when yeah. you arrived? Yeah. A bed? Yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I come here, I was new, so I asked a taxi man. It was next street from the station. <laughs> so he tell me, it's round the corner. <laughs> you don't I said, it. no, I don't know. So he charged me half a crown from station to Stanley Place, round the corner. <laughs> And he knocked the door and a fella comes out and he said, this is the place, I said yes. So all that waste, and he used to, I remember him now, and he used to bag it up in a box and weigh it, and he said, I said to him one day, I said, where does that lot go? You know what he said? Goes to line coffins. <laughs> Goes to line coffins. <laughs> and was he telling me that? I said, yeah, they, 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 so many a person's been laid to rest in Kotal's waste. <laughs> Was somebody getting a secret bob or two for passing it on to the undertakers, I wonder? So, were you at Kotal's until it closed? Yep. How did you feel at the end when it closed? Sooner or later, they're going to close it. Yeah. Because in 1971, they had a fire at night time. So all roof burned up. Once they fire, they couldn't manage like before because in summertime it's all right, but in winter, so all cold air coming in, water going freeze, right. machine going freeze. So the machines could break work properly. Yeah, to, machine, machine work proper, but weather climb, climate not suitable for that kind of machine. So could you not work? I we do work. We have to work. But, machine breakdown. Throughout May and June 2014, the Colours of the World Made in Preston project offered a series of creative community events focusing on the history and the legacy of the Courtauld's Rayon Textile Factory in Preston. This factory stood on the site of what is now Red Scar Business Park and was one of the largest employers in Preston's history between its opening in 1939 and closure in 1980. Courtauld's brought together the multi-ethnic mixed communities we know in Preston today and in Fishwick and St Matthews in particular. From the 1950s onwards, the Red Scar plant attracted workers to Preston from India and Pakistan, the Caribbean and many parts of Europe. This heritage lottery funded project was created by Dovetail in association with author Alison Boyle and Artificial Silk. Dovetail has been working on change making partnerships and projects with the people of Preston for several years now. The Colours of the World project was inspired by the glorious colours of the range of artificial silks or rayon fibres produced at Courtauld's. Dovetail and Artificial Silk ran a small but successful quick win lottery project towards the end of 2013. Alison Boyle is the author of the recent novel From Pakistan to Preston, which is set in the Courtauld's and the Preston of 1972. Alison co-wrote the book with Father Terry, whose in-depth knowledge of Courtauld's comes from a long career working in the laboratories of the factory. The Song in Seconds workshop welcomed people to bring memories of life at Courtauld's into a community singing and songwriting workshop led by singer-songwriter Claire Mooney and promoted by the Friends of Fishwick and St Matthews. So, any ideas about what we're going to write a song seeing uh, uh, that we have spoken about all the shades? Uh, we have all these posters around that have some gorgeous, gorgeous names like Carousel. Anything else, but I mean, the main ingredients we're going to do is very fast. Uh, the tune and the melody, the beat, uh, and the word. Okay, okay. I love the idea you said about Tennyson Street, too, and I thought it's a place yeah. of poets. Yeah. And now I'm finding that you are. Areas. Yeah. Something about The 
Friends of Fishwick and St Matthew's group has been working with local people over recent years to improve the communities of Fishwick and St Matthew's, coordinating community projects and producing a new neighbourhood plan. With the benefit of a further exciting £1 million big local lottery investment for Inner East Preston, the future looks bright for a sustainable big local plan and an impact on health and well-being, safety on the streets, access to jobs and training, children's services and facilities, making Fisher and St Matthews and Inner East Preston a better, safer, cleaner, healthier place for everyone to live in and to work in. But in looking to the future, a community should not forget its past. There are many people still living in our local communities who have a rich store of personal stories and living memories of their own or their family's time spent working at Courtauld's between 1939 and 1980. Many of these memories have never been collected and shared before, but they form a key part of Preston's industrial and social history. Whether they be from English-born or migrant workers, whether they be happy memories or memories of particularly difficult, dangerous jobs and working conditions, the Colours of the World project aim to collect as many of these as possible over the months of May and June 2014. The Colours of the World Made in Preston project launched officially with a first event on Saturday 17th of May 2014, but in the weeks prior to that much work, planning and promotion was already going on. Gary Cunliffe, oral historian and filmmaker on the project, made a project introduction film to tell the story of Courtauld's using archive photos, maps and film alongside modern day footage. The intention was to create a mix of history, heritage, geography and science which would engage both the people who had known the plant and those who had absolutely no idea about the factory's history. Many thanks must be given to Blog Preston for online coverage of this film and their later comprehensive coverage of the whole project. A most unexpected connection was made at this early stage of the project with a former Courtauld's apprentice and employee, Keith Sargent. Whilst researching archive photos for the film on the Preston Digital Archive on the Flickr photo sharing website, Gary became aware that many of the photos, particularly of demolition, had been submitted by Keith, who worked at Courtauld's from 1973 till its closure in 1980. Having worked in maintenance, Keith's knowledge of the plant is very, very detailed. This led to the first of many individual interviews which form part of the project, and Keith and his former colleague Frank Boyle came down to appear on the Ella Factory show on Preston FM. Here's an extract. A local radio station. For local people. 103.2 Preston FM. Your community radio station. One Saturday evening I was bored at home and thought, I'll go and see how they're getting on with the demolition. So I went along the back of the fence um, and was looking in. There was a hole in the fence. Everything was quiet. Now I knew the plant very well, so I had to wander in to see what it was. What I found was there was an electrical cabinet in there, full of old relays, which they were just going to scrap. Now a friend of mine was interested in getting some of these, so Monday morning we rang up the scrap company dealing with it and said, we've seen this cabinet, can we make you an offer for it? So then we got access in legally and uh, went in and took cameras with us. but you also found a treasure trove, a bit like a Viking hoard, a bit like the Cuerdale hoard. Yeah, it was just... Because those, those are the photos which are on Flickr now in the mm -hmm. present digital archive. Where did you find them? It was a bit of luck, as we were on site, they were clearing out the old dark room, the company dark room, and just skipping everything. Um, so I said to the guy, what's happening to these? They just go in. So I said, well, can I take some? He said, I don't mind. The, thought, the official photograph that I was on at Court Halls was the Apprentice Christmas Party. Which one are you? Well, one, one, <laughs> I'll show, I'll show. The, you that away. With one, one, oh, yes, yeah, we yeah. all had sort of... Um, I'm going to put this one in the film. We all, <laughs> by all means. Frank. By all means. Keith had been gathering together his own memories of Courtauld's over recent years, and the launch of this project inspired him to finally publish these online on his own website at www.redscarworks.org.uk. This website is a treasure trove of facts about the plant alongside many personal memories. It is well worth a visit and a much valued and unexpected result of the Colours of the World project. Thank you Keith. So we've now set the scene for the official start of the Colours of the World project celebrating the Cortals Red Scar plant on Saturday 17th of May 
at St Matthew's Mission on Acregate Lane in Preston. During the days before the event, the call went out to people with a link to the factory to come forward and share memories. Social media was the obvious channel, but we must also thank the Lancashire Evening Post, Blog Preston, Preston FM and of course BBC Radio Lancashire, which ran an interview with Frankie Mullen and Gary Cunliffe on the two consecutive days before the launch event. So on the 17th of May, a group of former employees, families and friends came together to listen and to share memories. First speaker of the day was Lynn Broster of the Textile Society. I used to work at Utah with an Andy actually uh, many years ago and um, I was a design historian and one of the things that I did look at at those in those years was the history of man-made fibre and rail in particular. I'm just going to say that D.C. Coleman in his book on the textile manufacture of Courtauld wrote the rise of rail in the first half of the 20th century was one of the greatest industrial booms of recent history, of great and far-reaching importance economically, technically and socially. And it's only now when you reflect back on that and you realise just how true that was. Rail was one of the first man-made fibres and Cortos took up the patent for producing rail by the viscose process in 1904. In the 20s, the upper and middle class women all wore silk underwear. And new developments in, in synthetic fibres meant that these designs could be copied. And I've actually got a beautiful pair of synthetic, synthetic knickers here, uh, made from one of the first um, rail uh, types of fabric. People didn't have to go out and buy silk garments anymore. They could actually wear the cheap imitation. And um, in Britain after World War I uh, and in the 1930s, they had successfully um, developed this on a huge commercial scale. Courthouse had a heavy advertising campaign in 1936 aimed at the consumer as well as the textile manufacturers to create a consumer demand for this product. Courthouse advertised in women's magazines. The Picture Girl and Weldon's Home Dressmaker were two of the um, magazines that would have been read by women at that time. And they gave free patterns for dressmaking and suggested these new innovative rayon fabrics. They gave them names such names as Delcia, Silkella, and Courgette. And this was before the English were introduced to the vegetable, so Courgette was not known at that time. Uh, 1931, and it's man-made fibre, rayon, and as you can see, uh, the fabric, and there's lots of detail in it, but um, it is definitely man-made fibre. This came from somebody's dressing up box, and I've used it over the years to show all the detail that um, they had in that Hollywood um, exerted a great influence over fashion in the interwar period. And Hollywood bent the glamour, and women were eager to simulate the stars and the styles. Rayon was a cheaper option to make, and they could copy the styles from the patterns in the, in the magazines, uh, the stars that the, sto the stars wore. Um, polyester, names you all know now, Terrily. They've been used for permanently pleated skirts, bed linen, furnishing fabrics, acrylics, had numerous variants, Cortel, Crimpoli, Daquan, Draylon, Aquilan. They all developed from rail. Next up at the launch event was a question and answer session with Alison Boyle, author of From Pakistan to Preston, and Anandi Ramamurthy, senior lecturer at UCLan with a particular interest in cultural studies. After hearing Alison's motivations for writing the novel, conversations soon turned to the 1965 strike in the CSPT tyre cord department and then on to shared memories of working conditions in general at the plant. For me, the idea of the factory setting was, from a writer's point of view, it was quite a challenge. It was obviously it was enormous. It was over 4,000 at peak, 2,600 when it closed. So that was an interesting idea. How do you write about a really big place? Um, 
But one of the things that I've just heard all my life is these stories about all the people, the funny stories, you know, it's, we try to be very humorous, you know, their songs, the archery, all the different things that were going on at Quartals, not just the manufacturing. Mum and Dad worked in the laboratory, they met there, and, and I know that lots of people met at the factory. So it was partly um, trying to give space for those kind of stories, because as far as I was aware, the, the factory settings are not used very much, and artificial silk hadn't really been written about. And I felt there was just lots of opportunity to get that humour and that, um, yeah, the way people work together. Um, but I think the other important part of it is the idea of community of workers outside the factory. So I've met people here who was lovely who knew my grandma and granddad who used to live around the corner. We used to come to tea here every Saturday. And that's really important, the idea of um, terraced houses which were built for cotton workers, which is the basis of the artificial silk, um, often being lived in by people who then uh, were, were working at court halls and artificial silk. So it's kind of a very personal, if you say, very personal reason. You situated the novel in 1972, particularly yeah. because it was the Guild, so it was a kind of an extraordinary moment, uh, um, I imagine. And can you just say a bit about that? Yeah. Obviously, we only get around to it over 20 years in Preston, and I wish we did it more often. I think a lot of people feel the same. Um, 1972, I was involved with the Guild as a child, so there was a personal memory. So, Guild was quite important. Um, I wanted to use it again as an example of bringing people together. And you know, I'm interested in a very specific moment in Cortal's history, which is a strike that took place, I don't know if any of you remember it, from 1965 of the Asian workers' strike, um, because in fact the, work, the management wanted to increase their work by 50%. Well, I, I don't think the strike was um, official. I don't, we had another, we had about three. It wasn't, it was declared unofficial. They were out for about three or four weeks. Yeah. And then they did go back. But there is, there, I've got, to, this is in um, a it, document which really Mr. Charger came, didn't he? Mr. Charger was, was the man running the thing. Uh, he came from uh, from London up here to, to talk to the the, uh, the Asian people. Oh, I know there was a mention that there wasn't a sort of um, a racial division of labour, and there might not have been in a lot of the departments at Courtauld's, but there was in terms of the time called spinning department, which I think was almost all Asian, although there were also African Caribbean workers, but it was mainly black workers, and that was where there was this strike no, that's, in that, that isn't true. <coughs> A man who just was here earlier on, and he worked in that department, and he was talking about how, in fact, most people wouldn't work there because he said the smell was absolutely awful with the acid, and it was quite dangerous as well. About eight white people in the same department. Well, I was going to say six to eight, I would say, out of uh, you know the rest were. Pakistan is West Indian as well. But we, we all know about it. We all know about it, you know. Yeah. And the work was very arduous, really, because of that. I don't think in these days with health and safety, <laughs> there would have to be a lot of uh, improvements one way or another. You know, a battle acid there, you know. And initially, in, in the good old days, you didn't wear gloves or anything. Eventually, you had rubber gloves you could wear. But, uh, I mean, all your clothes uh, just fell to pieces eventually because of the acid uh, falling on your clothes and so on. And you worked in that department, did you? So work? I was in there for eight years. Wow. You see. Round about what day? Uh, wait a minute now. That would be about... Uh, I started at Hall 61, I was about three years in the weaving department and then it closed down. So they put us all in spinning, some went in box spinning, some in CSP. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem was you couldn't get out of CSP, <laughs> it was the lab centre. <laughs> but my hook or my crew I managed to get out and uh, ended up in cake wash but uh, it was hot very sweaty and you're dipping your hands in this uh, 
sulfuric acid and bringing the arm down and so on, you know. But you got used to it, you know, and uh, uh, the thing is, to be quite honest, a lot of uh, Englishmen who get better jobs so often when they get them, so. And I think it's all credit to the Pakistanis and the West Indians in that they come into the country and they've got the first job they got and they have to get established in the country. And that's what they did, you know, and they worked hard. They worked hard. And very on social hours, which went through Christmas and uh, uh, Easter without a stop. The wheels kept turning. Yeah. The whole factory just kept going over Christmas then. Yes, and the reason for that was a practical one. Not just the production, but as far as I understand it, and the, the engineers here will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, the reason for keeping the job going wasn't so much the profit market. It was the fact that this uh, uh, viscous in the pipes, you couldn't just switch it on. Yeah. Otherwise, it began yeah. to solidify in the pipes. Yeah. And uh, it was a monumental job yes. to get the whole system cleaned out and get running again. Lots of people took shift work because it paid extra. I was talking to a chap over there who was saying um, that the, the wages were, and I have read this too, wages at quarters were actually relatively good. And so he went from £7 to his previous, from his previous job to £17. Um, and then when he did shift work, he, he had extras, he got about £25. Yes, before to a train, you had to do so many trays in a day, didn't you? Yeah. But there was different demos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 25, 27, yeah. uh, 350, there was different tenures. That there, there were all different tenures on each. I used to work in the middle. So it would come in from the top, it would come along, and then I would pull a knob, <laughs> which you can just about see. Each corner was weighing five pounds, so it was 20 pounds per tray. If you notice, each one of those trays has got four corners on. Yeah. Did you get into trouble if you didn't do enough trays or how, how did it no. work? Well, no, you just didn't get your bonus. It just to get it, you didn't get it. That's right. It, yeah. If it was on a low denue, yeah. then it was difficult. If it was on a higher denue, you didn't need as many cakes to make a call. Because it was so heavier. You could, yeah, because you could, and then if, you, if it was on a good denue, you could make a good bonus. And if it was on a low denue, like I'm talking to one, there was one particular um, order, which was, which was from Russia, and there was spinner green, maroon, yeah. Pacific blue, oh, and oh, scarlet. Oh, no, 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 scarlet. Scarlet was four of them, and if they were for Russian order, and they were a terrible order because they used to do a lot of slugging up, which used to go through the machines where you thread it up from your cake through the machine and up onto the cone, and you used to have five knots at the front of each cone. So you take your cone through, you take your thread through from this end, you'd have your, your, your thread from on the cone, you take it underneath, you join the two together, you would do the knot, and then you would bring that knot round to the front of the cone. And you want to have at least five knots. If you did, it was a void cone. It had to be being wound and start all over again. In fact, there was a penalty in the cone department because if you had a lot of waste, if you remember, you had to, at the end of the shift, you had to cure and weigh in your waste. And if you had more than, than the, uh, the amount, you got, got some money knocked off, didn't you? But the ladies never had any money knocked off because any waste that they had... Check it out. <laughs> What was becoming clear early in the project was that despite Cortals being regarded as good employers, particularly in regard to wages, there were serious concerns about working conditions and health and safety in certain parts of the plant, most obviously in the spinning departments. Quite soon after the launch event, two letters appeared in the Lancashire Evening Post. The first from local councillor Terry Cartwright and the second from Aidan Turner Bishop. I was interested to read the article celebrating Cortols about the beautiful materials produced there, 
and I agree, our community is all the better for the people who settled here after coming from many other countries to work at Courtauld's. But at what cost? Acid was used to produce the coloured rayon, and this seeped into the clothes of the people carrying out this work, as there was no protective clothing, and they would also have breathed the fumes in. At this time, nobody thought about the conditions and just carried out their work. My other memories are the awful stink the processing gave off, which entered all the houses in and around Ribbleton. As far as I know, Cortols didn't pay a penny to clean up the environment they polluted. I know many people complain about health and safety regulations and think they're a waste of time, but please take note of the above, as I'm sure nobody would want to return to the Cortols days. Councillor Terry Cartwright, Deepdale Ward as Councillor Cartwright points out, many migrant workers came to settle in Preston drawn by the availability of work at Courtaulds. From the late 1940s early 50s, workers came from former English colonies and from Europe to work in England. In Preston, the beginnings of our Muslim and Hindu communities are directly linked to Courtaulds. On the 27th of May 2014, we held a very well attended meeting at Preston Gujarat Hindu Community Centre on South Meadow Lane coordinated for us by Ishwa Taylor. You already say, okay, in the early 60s, you were single. So that one, was, one of the things was they came here for work. You came here for work, didn't you? The main thing was that they needed work. And Kotos was one place where there was work. The other company was BTR. There is a, there is a another textile mill. Yes. But Kotos have a more wages than so any other. A lot of more so so At that, that time, at that time, the time, 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 yeah, time, at that time, so you think, at that time, at that time, you are saying that in the 60s, Portals was paying the best money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that, that was one of the reasons what attracted people to go there. Yes, those are people there. So that was one of the reasons. I'd like to point out that Pratilov, right? Who came in when? 1960? 1961. He came in 61 and you joined Portals? Portals. Straight yeah. away? No, I was in a two months in Coventry. Okay. I couldn't find a job there. I came from Africa here on the 5th of October 1960 and I started with Portals on the 13th of October 1960 until 1975. Okay. I left Portals according to the doctor's advice. So I, I, I had a bronchitis problem, you see. Uh, how long, who has worked the longest? I would say 18 years. You were there 18 years, so you started in 68. 68. 68. Uh, when did you start? Uh, 70. 70. Okay. You have a story to tell us <coughs> about? Well, I started in 1953. 1953. <coughs> I was a, an apprentice chemical plumber. Okay, at, at Cortos? Yes, yeah. and I, I served uh, an apprenticeship for six years. <coughs> and then I, I was also, I was there, finished up being there for 14 years before I left to start working for myself. Okay. But um, I was shift plumber on A Group for five years. So I've worked in all the places that these people have worked. Okay. and some that they want to like to work in, work in. but uh, I always admire them because the temperatures in the summer will get above 100 degrees yeah. and uh, it was unbelievable. The question was when you went on strike what was the feeling? How, how did you cope with it in terms of in terms of money? Did you lose money? How long were you on strike for? 23 days just 23 days? Three, four, three weeks, nearly okay. three weeks. And what happened in that three weeks? There was a slight breakdown, you know. The, the court house is a big company. Yeah. You know, they, some people in court house working, they okay. not miss strike people, you know. Okay. So, the black ship, you know, some black ship, you know. Yeah, three know. weeks, then people started to go to work. The half people outside. They sent, sent them over there. Then they started over there. If you want to come down, you can start over here, over there. And we will really just take you. Okay. We will take you over there. Okay. You were working shift work? Yeah. Okay, so you were getting up uh, for morning shift at 5 o'clock? Yeah. 6 o'clock. 
Yeah, you started at this. Yes. But you all had families. Yeah. And you faced discrimination. You know, like in your shift, there might have been a manager or somebody who was awkward. Yes. Yeah. How did you cope with that? I have to do it. You have to do it. I 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 Everybody's enjoying that. Okay. So you'd say yeah. that Otos was a good experience. Yeah. 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 In terms of wages, in terms of health and safety, yeah. and it also allowed you flexibility. Yes. Yeah. And everybody enjoyed that. Okay. People crying when it's finished. Yeah. <laughs> The Red Scar Business Park today gives little indication of the huge factory that was based here between 1939 and its demolition in the early 80s. Our young people today, therefore, have no idea where Cortals was or what it meant to local communities and indeed to the whole of Preston. It was always our intention on this project to take the story of Cortals to young people. Here's a brief look at what happened when artist Steve Asbury of Smiley Studios and Gary Cunliffe took an art workshop to Callan Kids Club. This workshop was called Wish You Were Here and took the story of Cortolds and its Duracol colours as the starting point for a colour mixing experience. What do you reckon that is? The class. Is it hair? No. What is it? Like, yeah. It's material. This is, this is me and Steve having our lunch break. <laughs> what got, are you? We got dressed up as the old, old days men with our flat caps on. Yeah. No, it's not me and Steve, is it? Where do you think these men work? These the are stuff. These are threads that we're going to end up looking like that, all plaited and twisted and lovely. They're not wool, they're not cotton, they're not sheep or anything like that. They are man-made in a factory. Now that was the factory, or one part of the factory. Have a guess where that factory was. Yeah, in England. Good start. Brilliant. Now, even better, second answer. <laughs> this factory was less than a mile. Colin, would you say about a mile yeah. and a bit from where we're sitting? Today. What I'm going to show you is you, uh, you must have done colour mixing at school with just yeah. you met what what so what colour makes green? Um 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 I've got it Some yellow and yellow and red yellow and blue. Yes, no, great. Blue, uh now what colours are on that chart there? There's there's a lemon yellow there, isn't there? So let's use a lemon yellow, a cool yellow, a and let's, let's have a look just at try this lemon yellow on there. I'm not gonna paint. No, that isn't green, is it? So what colour would mix with that to mix? Blue, blue. Yeah. I just said hello, and you said you're Colin's brother. Yeah. You used to work at Cortos. That's right. What did you do? I was in box spinning. Just yeah. put the protective gloves on. Right. Have a, ch uh, a glass cup like that. Put the rayon up. Round it down like that, like that. Into a glass tube. And that's what I used to do on uh, a, you look at all the TV. Must have been about 50, 60 on each row. Hey, what colours have you been mixing? Hey, I've just um, got green. 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 My fruit, but the field across from my house, literally, was dominated by the towers. Yeah. Oh, it's old towers, yeah. So the towers and the Why are you letting your name on it? That's where the stretch of the motorway is, literally. About 300 yards away from my house, dropped down into the motorway, which then went to the left. You were too young to remember the motorway being built though, weren't you? That's right, yeah, it was 1960 maybe, so yeah, it was so made before that. It was already there. Yeah. Why do I like it? I don't know. I think I notice the um, the weather outside and, and the mood of the, the colours that they're choosing. Uh, uh, the environment outside is having a direct effect on, 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 on the, the mood. I hope it never affected Cortos. <laughs> so that could have been a multi million pound loss, couldn't it? But they, they have actually created some lovely uh, colours and I, I think they've learned a lot about that. Okay. Katie, you've you've got these oranges. Have you come up with a name for that orange yet? No. To me, it looks like a sunset. What do you reckon? Or a fire? Mm. Do you reckon we could call that something to do with the sunset? Setting sun. 
So that you've created a colour called setting sun. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yes. So so let's imagine we were looking out the window. So what what might we say that we might say um, mm. summer evening. Summer evening. Mm. A summer evening. So summer evening. I'm gonna get you a drink. What else? Where where do you see the setting sun? You see it on the skyline, don't you? On the horizon. On the horizon. So summer evening. On the horizon. The colour of and what was it again? Right, so we've got your poem. That's it. We've got your colour name. That's it. In the poem. Yes. So you created in fact we're gonna show that to the camera because we're that proud. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. Summer evening, on the horizon, the colour setting sun. Isn't it? Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> Can we say that together? Let's, I'll say it, you repeat it. Grey clouds. Grey clouds. Black sky. Black sky. Black sky. Thunder striking. Thunder striking. Wow. Wow. We're going to write that down and it's a perfect <laughs> poem. You can turn off now because it's boring watching somebody write it. Arts organisation Dovetail is producing a series of events in Fishwick and St Matthews to collect memories and celebrate the heritage of the world famous institution. I'm pleased to say joining me now to uh, tell us more, someone we've met many many times on the afternoon programme, Gary Cunliffe, project worker and uh, renowned Northwest musician Claire Mooney to tell us more this afternoon. Welcome along to both of you. Uh, I ran the Song in Seconds uh, session just before Christmas um, and it was really successful. We had eight, nine year olds to 17 year olds all giving ideas. We created a song literally in seconds and from that we're going to do some more sessions in the next couple of weeks so we'll be um, we're doing uh, another session next wednesday on the 4th at st matthew's mission from 6 30 to 8 30 and everybody is welcome irrespective of your musical prowess Just three, four, Can trust from BBC Radio Lancashire. 16 and a half minutes past four o'clock. Sean McGinty in for Gary Hicks, and thank you very much for listening to us this afternoon. We've met with lots of people who've worked there, mm. and they've come and shared their stories. And, and we start off with a formal meeting, but it, it ends up into a great big interesting discussion. Yeah. And you find out loads of things. And tomorrow is the last event, but we still want people to come and join us because I've made uh, a documentary film of all the things we've done since May the 17th when the project launched. So if you've not been to any of the uh, of the events so far, there is a, a film to fill you in on what we've done. And I'm sure you'll hopefully come back here on BBC Radio Lancashire and we'll hear some more of that great audio as well. Yes, and we want people to come and see us tomorrow. Tomorrow? Two o'clock, St Matthew's Mission, Eckergate Lane, Preston, Courtauld's, come. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> if you know anybody that's worked in Courtauld's, if you dance, think your grandma sisters. did, <laughs> root the drawers out and come down and see Gary. Gary Cunliffe, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I have. I've brought some photographs from that my dad used to have. He was the site services engineer, so he was. He ended up being in charge of all the power plants, the chim, the stack water coolers, the chimneys, the lots. So, so, so I've brought out. So he's there on that one. That's going in focus. 
We just had to be walking across the shot, didn't he? Yes, yes. <laughs> Which is um, here. He's there on that one. Now, I'm not sure if he's being presented or if he's doing the presentation. It's more likely doing the presentation because I don't recognise that. So tell us his job again. He was, he was the site services manager. He was sort of second in command on the engineering side. That was very important. Yes, yeah. Got it wrong with Well, yeah. <laughs> um, we moved up here in 1970 from Wolverhampton, which was the court halls there, and he stayed till the end when he got transferred out to Swaziland, in, which is between South Africa and Mozambique. Um, no, I stayed here, but my parents both went over there, so yeah. I mean, he was already 61 when the plant shut, so he did eight years over there as well. It was producing the pulp that used to be imported to this, the Preston plant, as far as I'm aware. Where he went to? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was a forestry mill. But I'm still in Preston, yeah. And uh, it was created by a dozen people. And if you've ever been in a band, Okay, you know that after the first five minutes they're not going to split up. We didn't. These gorgeous people, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a minute, um, hung around for two sessions and um, came up with loads of ideas. The song has a poignancy, um, but it also does mention about the hard work that went on at Courtauld's. The amazing thing I often think about songs is they tell a big story in only three and a half minutes. <coughs>
This event on the 21st of June 2014 was the last event of the Dovetail Colours of the World Made in Preston project, celebrating the history of Courtauld's Red Scar Rayon Works. As you've seen from this film, the project has gathered a wealth of memories from the people of Preston and has created a new and rich archive of how much Courtauld's meant to Preston between its opening in 1939, its closure in 1980 and indeed what it still means to the people of Preston today.